All right, everyone. Uh, good evening. This is uh, our last Hang Tough Chalk Talks of the year, and we're blessed and lucky to have uh, Jackie Joseph uh, join us, former Michigan State head coach, um, hopefully enjoying, enjoying some of her retirement. I know you're still working with the uh, athletic department at MSU. Um, but, you know, again, for anybody that's new on the call this evening, and we will be recording it to upload to our YouTube channel, is that the whole purpose of this is to allow our girls to have the opportunity and families to listen in um, to different guests that we have that share their softball journey. Um, a lot of times uh, you don't have the opportunity to, unless you know someone that's been through the process, um, their experiences or like the recruiting process, for instance, um, you wouldn't know what questions to ask. So this is a great opportunity to engage guests ask questions um, and, and just listen to the conversation in general. And obviously it's um, on our channel that you can always go back to and listen and, and watch again. So again, tonight, um, Jackie Joseph, which is you no know, fantastic uh, way to end the season here. Um, coached 29 seasons at Michigan State and, you know, obviously uh, NFCA uh, Hall of Fame coach and also the winningest uh, coach in the Spartan program, softball program, and um, you've forgotten more softball than I'll ever know. <laughs> it's always great well, to have those types of guests on. <laughs> well, I appreciate it. It's a pleasure to be with you guys. And uh, um, the first thing I want to say is I am still working, and I work at Michigan State. And if people have questions, follow-up questions, they can always – you know, get through you and then get to me. And I'm happy to help anybody, you know, along the way. I have a lot more free time now. Um, I work full time and it feels like half time compared to what I was doing as a coach. So I, um, I want to say how much I respect the Hang Tough organization. You guys have been around a while, a long time. And uh, when you first started, I, I was very impressed with the effort that all the coaches uh, over the years uh, and administrators with Hank Tuff have made to, to try to do the best by their kids and families. And it's always been super impressive to me how hard you guys have worked. And I've, I've had a lot of respect for that. So, um, and that's why I agreed to do it because I know you guys are not uh, a fly by night. You guys are real professional and trying to get it right and trying to, trying to do right by your, your players and your families and your coaches. So I, I pre I've always appreciated that very much. Yeah. Um, just you. a quick summary of uh, my background. I was born and raised in Flint, Michigan. Um, in, in my day, we didn't really have organized sports. There was no youth ball like it is today. We just played and, you know, and, and uh, I was before uh, scholarships and title line and all that. So, but anyway, in those days you could try out. And uh, I went to, uh, a school where all the teachers were from central Michigan. And so there was really only one option for me. And of course they had a great legendary coach in Margot Yonker at, at central. So I went to central Michigan, um, walked on that team um, and then played. And then after my four years there, the coach asked me to stay and become a, a coach in those days we were called graduate assistants. And so I got my master's degree, played and, 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 and started my coaching career at Central. And then I went to Indiana for a season, um, an assistant coach at Indiana, and then became uh, one of the youngest head coaches in the country at Bowling Green State University in Ohio. And I was there for five years. Um, and, then I, and then I went from Bowling Green to Michigan State. So I've been a, I had been a head coach. I, I had been in, uh, in coaching for 37 years. I'd been a head coach for 34 years, um, all in division one. And so um, I would tell you that I consider myself an expert in division one. Um, I'm not an expert in youth ball, I'm not an expert in high school ball. I've never done any of that. You guys have done that. So I always like to think I have as much to learn from the people on the ground, the people who work with that age group. Um, I can only speak to what I know. Um, you have it. Oh, oh, I has got a muter iPhone. Oh, you know, uh, there we go. 
There you go. Yep. Anyway, so that's a little bit about me. Um, had an awesome time here and, um, you know, and learned a lot. Basically I had a, you know, a front row seat to all of it. Um, all of the change. And I, um, stepped down two seasons ago. So, um, transfer portal and NIL were just starting in earnest when I, when I got out, but, uh, um, but in my role now, I work with four teams, and uh, so I have a little bit of uh, perspective on on how the other sports work as well. So that's a little bit about um, about me. Scott, do you want to ask me the questions, or you want me to just go down this email that you sent? Um, yeah, I can I can ask you the questions. Okay, um, I, I appreciate it. Um, again, you know, I one of the things I always appreciated about you because I. You know, I came into this and obviously you'd been in Michigan State for a long time and you were always so generous uh, with your time, allowing our coaches. And sometimes we brought players to practices. Um, you always uh, took the time to talk to us and tell us, you know, why you were doing the things you were doing. And um, even some of the things that were, you know, issues that you saw with college players coming into, you know, high school players coming into college and things to look for and things to kind of share with your parents and um, we've always appreciated that, and you know, and thank you very much. Um, the next question on our list here tonight, um, we tried to really gear this towards uh, the families and the different age groups that we would have on. And I think a really important question is what what do you look for, or what non softball characteristics do you look for in a player? And I know that's yeah, something it, that we're asking. Yeah. It's a great question and it's it's super important because there are a lot of good players, right? And you're looking for what's going to separate them. Um, rarely is any school, maybe the top five schools in the country in each category, right? In each division, if you will, at each level, will get the A-plus talent kid where – um, you know, maybe they would look beyond certain things, uh, but the the character traits are always the the things that will separate a player. This player gets better, and this player never gets better, or this player really achieves her ability, and this player flames out. And some of the things you're looking for have a lot to do with, um just the player's ability to articulate why she wants to play the maturity level, the emotional intelligence of the player. And how do you see those kinds of things? Well, coaches that have been around a while are pretty savvy about picking up those cues and, and asking the right questions that will reveal where the player is and their ability to fit within your program. So it's a big complicated thing, but at the end of the day, getting the fit right is more important than getting the talent right. So for example, if you have a player that fits athletically but doesn't fit academically she will struggle at your school and every school is different so the fit academically is important right the fit socially is important so and i'm going to talk about this later about advice to parents what are you looking for you're looking for a fit in four areas so is the school and those four areas are always academics, social, the softball piece, and then the financial fit, right? That's what you're looking for. So I might go out and find a player and she's never slept away from her parents. She never had a sleepover uh, away from her parents. And let's just say I'm recruiting somebody from 12 states away but she's never been able to demonstrate any independence at all. That's not probably not going to be a good fit. 
kids, you know, going away to school distance is nothing for some kids. And some kids have never done a load of laundry. If you are a junior in high school and you haven't traveled alone, um, and I'm not saying alone, like literally alone, I'm just saying without your parents or without your parents being immediately responsible for you in every way, you haven't done a load of laundry, you haven't had an extended curfew, you haven't been given any of the opportunities to grow and demonstrate the ability to make good choices, chances are you probably shouldn't go away to college, right? You shouldn't go far away. Um, other social things, there are some kids that are just, um, you know, maybe they're from a super, super small town and they need a small setting. That's not a bad thing. I could have never survived uh, on a campus as big as Michigan State's, let's say, uh, at that time in my life. Um, and so don't judge it as much as it is what it is. You know what you know. And in those areas, that's where the parents can help guide the player in saying things like, geez, Susie, are you sure you want to go 10 states away? I mean, you've never done X, Y, or Z, or you cried when you stayed at your grandparents, you know, that kind of thing. So there's the academic fit. Number one, are they in the middle or the upper middle of the standard academic profile of that school? You don't want to go to a school where you're the smartest one there because you won't be challenged and you'll be bored. You don't want to go to school where you're the dumbest one there because you won't feel worthy and it'll be a burden and it'll be depressing and it'll be just too much. It'll be overwhelming. You want to go to a school where you fit academically, right? My profile. And now a lot of schools are not requiring ACT, SAT. I highly recommend people take it because it's the only definitive way to know if you can hack it at that at those type of schools. It's it's not an indictment on your intellect. I, I didn't test well either, but it just showed me that I wasn't going to go to the Ivy Leagues, right? I have a, I have other redeeming qualities, but I knew I couldn't fit there. Socially, big town, small town, religious affiliation, non-religious affiliation, city, not a city, rural, whatever. Okay. The third fit is the softball piece. Do they need my position? What's the vision for the coach for me? Am I going to start as a freshman? As am I going to start as a sophomore? Do, where do they see me playing? Is it something I want to do? There's a lot of great pitchers in the country, but they can't pitch at certain levels but they could maybe play outfield. Um, that happens all the time. You get to pick that. Um, have I seen a practice? Have I been around the coaches? Have I watched that team play? Uh, when I take a visit, do I feel like I get along? Do I feel like I fit there? Do I think the coach is telling the truth? Um, the softball stuff, right? And then finally, there's the financial thing. And what most people make a mistake doing is they spend too much time on what's the scholarship and not what's left to pay. Because what's left to pay is paramount to the family's budget. Uh, okay. So like I could go to a school that costs $75,000 to go to school there. They're going to give me this giant scholarship of $25,000, but boy, I'm still left with $50,000 to pay. And that might not be what I have. Whereas this other school might be offering me X and I only have five to pay. And so focusing not on what they're going to offer that number, but what the number is left for the player to graduate and not based on, well, if I play good, I might get more money. No, because you could also break your ankle and not play. And so we don't want you to have to leave school because you're bankrupting your family. So, um, you know, having those open and honest conversations prior to when the searching starts about what our budget is, 
uh, what's our, how are we going to get you to graduation? Some families, it, it's not going to be a problem. They've already got the money saved. It's sitting over here or they may have, that's fine. Other families though, it might make more sense to knock off two years at a junior college, play and then transfer to a four year and everything in between. I mean, there is a place for everyone. It just might not be what you think it is at first until you start deep and diving in these four areas and, and thinking about, you know, um, the details in each one of these areas, academics, social, um, softball, and then finances. And when I looked for players, back to your original question, what are the intangibles? I am looking for a fit in those areas. And as I knock off the, the criteria, if you will, one of the things that I used to have was, does she have older brothers? It was like you have these grids and you would just, you would analyze your players and, and your recruits and, and you would figure out kids that match up with you well. Who can play for me? Because not everybody can play for me. They might be better off playing for somebody else. That's not a knock on anybody. It's just not a good fit, right? I found that players that have older brothers were tougher because they got beat up a lot as kids and they got pushed around. All right. I found that kids whose parents were, um, what, I, what do I want to say? How do I want to say this in a way to not be offensive, but kids who carried their own bags, Right kids that were responsible for setting their own alarms, kids that were responsible for their own food, kids that were just responsible because I coached at a place that required an exceptionally uh, put together kid because it was a huge school. It was, it was as competitive a level of as anybody in the country and not everybody was made up for it. So I was looking for kids who failed a lot and had a strong failure recovery system. They could not play and be a good teammate. They could play a position they didn't really like and be a good teammate. They could get benched and be a good teammate. They could take tough coaching and be a good teammate. Those are the kids that fit well with me. Kids that only ever played for their dad, kids that only ever started and played every game, kids whose mom who brought them a snack in between innings. That's not a kid that was going to be successful for me. Doesn't mean there's anything wrong with that or that kid. It just wasn't going to be a good fit. So to your question, what non-softball characteristics, each coach in each school is looking for their fit, their fit. And first and foremost, because of my value system, education was always the number one thing. For me, everything always started and ended with academics. It's, it's really hard to be a screw up in some things and not others. So typically kids that did well in school, even if well meant Bs, they gave great effort kids who did well that way, kids who had a strong work ethic, those kids were going to be successful under uh, for playing for me. Other people don't care about that. That's okay. There's plenty of schools that don't care about school. You can go play softball and they're not going to track your grades and they're not going to, you're not going to get tutors and they don't care if you graduate or not. That's okay. It just wasn't me. And so um, the more you know yourself as a head coach, the more you're able to go recruit players that you know will fit your system and your uh, university, as well as your style of play. I mean, 
There are some coaches that only recruit slappers or will have eight of 10 kids on their team that were slappers. And you might be a big bopper and a great player and you want to go there, but it doesn't fit that coach's style. It's just, there's lots of reasons why certain people get recruited and certain people don't. What is true is when you do something so exceptional people tend to look by your foibles if you will and let you slide because you're just a great player right and so they look past some of your bad behaviors as a good player and for me that's the most disrespectful thing we can do to a great player is let them off the hook because they're a great player but you'll see it all the time. Mm -hmm. A six foot left-handed pitcher throwing at 68. Mm, Really doesn't have to be that great of a kid to get an offer. I'm going to take a chance on that kid. But everybody else, no, not taking a chance. So that's a little, that's a long-winded answer. Um, But for me, if one of those things didn't fit, um, then then the kid was a no because it wasn't going to work out unless like i said she was six foot left-handed throwing at 68 then i'll take a flyer on her i'll take a chance <laughs> nope that's a it's a very interesting but truthful uh, yeah <laughs> statement yeah yeah uh, yeah people uh, yeah oh you see it every day yep. it makes people angry but you know what that's also life People, everybody has an advantage. Some people, it's like you get really mad at that kid that never comes to class and gets an A because that was never me. And But there'll always be kids that don't have to work and get A's. It's just not the majority of people. Yeah. You know, if if I walk into a room with a 6'2 blonde, trust me, all eyes are going to the 6'2 blonde because that's just the way the, the world works. So then I have to work that much harder, which is fine. Yep. That's there's nothing wrong with that. That's just the way it goes. So, um, you know, the other thing that I, for the parents that are on the call, that the hard reality of it is more kids are eliminated from going to schools because of them than because of their daughters. So when, when parents go to a game and watch a game, I promise you every coach there is watching the behavior of the parents and they're trying to put two and two together. And if you're a parent who screams instructions from the stands at a high school game or a club game, it's it's a it's a pen right through the line of the kid because we don't want that. And if you don't have enough respect for your coaches in high school, you're certainly not going to have respect for your college coaches because your college coach is going to make just as many mistakes. And your college coaches are going to do things that you don't agree with. And your college coaches are exactly the same. They might know a little more about the sport. Sure. Like you said, I've got 37 years of doing it. I I know a lot. But that doesn't mean that coaches aren't going to make mistakes. We're going to make mistakes every day. We're going to send a runner that gets thrown out. Trust me, we didn't try to do it. They're going to call a squeeze play. And the kid's going to pop it up. And we're going to get out and picked off third. That wasn't the signal. You don't have to yell it. Your displeasure. You don't have to stomp up and down. Pacing like you're going to die if your kid doesn't get a hit. All of those behaviors are seen and noted. And there again, what I would say that's the biggest untold secret about big time division one recruiting is they're watching the parents more than the kids. Once they've zoomed in on a kid, they figure out who the parent is and they decide whether or not that's a family that can come to our university. And if if people are acting like idiots, then next, 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 next. And I, I couldn't stress that enough um, because the family has to understand the parent's job is to guide the child, but it's the child's journey through the sport. 
Parents not playing the game. Parents not going to practice. Parents not doing the work. Show up. Clap for everybody. Stay out of it. Because it's it's her journey. And if we think it's your journey, then it's too much. We can't raise you and your daughter at the same time. It's too hard. If that makes sense. I'm glad you brought that up. I, I remember a conversation you had with me a couple of years ago. And you said that, uh, you know, the, the a negative atmosphere, like when you walk up to watch a game and if the families are negative, you know, and you can sense that atmosphere that coaches will just walk away. No, 100% even... walk away from the whole club. They'll walk away from the whole club because nobody wants that on their campus. And they don't – playing softball in college is so hard on the kids that they don't need all that drama in their lives. They need parents who support them, whether they get a hit or they go over 10, that they just enjoy being around each other's kids and the families and they appreciate it's their journey, not people that make it so hard for their kids. They can't even, it's not fun anymore because they feel like they're disappointing somebody. See, the biggest thing is that there's nothing a player wants more than to please the coach and to please their parents. And when those two people aren't on the same page, it puts the kid in the middle. And that's a horrible place for a child to be is in the middle. Well, my coach said this, but my dad said this. My coach said this, but my mom said this. My coach said this, but my grandpa said that. And now the kid's just like, oh, I don't know what to do. <laughs> and it, you can't play that way. I mean, no. and, you know, it's just game day is for the kids to just play. It's not for 12 people to shout instructions at them. It. Who could possibly function with all these messages being shouted at them? Over about everything. I'm like, oh my God, I would get a headache. Just please stop. Just, you know, let, let them play and then we'll see. And then that failure recovery piece is huge because failing, failing in this game is part of it you ain't hitting a thousand I don't care who you are and your ERA is not gonna be 0, 0.00 and that's okay we want to see you get up we want to see what's next we want to see your recovery what do you do the next at bat what do you do the next pitch you went for that ball it was a great effort you made a great dive on it you didn't catch it what do you do when you get up how do you act around how do you cheer for your teammates because all of that is going to come to play at the next level. And we're happy to teach it. And college coaches want to create an environment where kids can learn and grow, but they can't do it if there's constant interference. Mm -hmm. You know? Yep. No, I completely understand. So what, what advice um, do you have for uh, parents who – um, or navigating the recruiting process. It's always yeah. great to talk to somebody yeah. with all of your experience. And I, I think that the thing is, is, is these parents, they know their kid. They know their child. And they're the bumpers, if you will, while the child is moving through it. And, and they ask the questions. Uh, Susie, um, you know, are you sure you want to go to... Timbuktu, you, you know, normally you don't like to, you know, be alone or be away from the house or, you know, Susie, I think that, you know, you, you enjoy big cities, you enjoy city life, you enjoy concerts and going out, you know, maybe, you know, looking at a community that's a little bigger or, um, you know, uh, your GPA is 3.0 and, you work hard and, you know, this academic school, you know, their profile is 3.89 or 3.9. So the parent helps guide without making it their journey. And they question the child and they help them. Also, they don't project their own fears 
right? Just because I couldn't have gone to a big school doesn't mean my daughter couldn't go to a big school. But the parents know these things. And they, they, what I always want to ask parents, I ask them this question, does your daughter know you love her? Whether you play an inning or not, does she know? Does she know deep down? Because I think parents want to have their kids in their lives when the kid is done with softball. And some people almost choose the softball over the kid. And that to me is, would be a mistake. Guide, love, say things like, I love to watch you play. I love to watch your team play. I enjoyed being here today. Uh, whatever you do, do not talk about softball after the game. If you're a parent, don't do it. Don't get in the car and immediately go down the litany of things she didn't do right. Or the litany of reasons the coach is an idiot. Or the litany of things that Susie's mom did. None of it. Get in the car. Did you have fun? Did you have fun? I love to watch you play. I love to watch your team play. Because, you know, that that's the only way the kid's going to really know that it's okay if the kid doesn't play. If the kid wants to play, if the child wants to play, there's a place for her to play. I can almost guarantee it. But if she doesn't, that's okay too. You know, one of my best players that, that, that played for me at Michigan State was a level 11 gymnast up until the summer before she went to college. A, a level 11 is like really, really good at gymnastics. I think that's what the level was, whatever it was. She was going to be a gymnast. And you know what? The summer before she went to college, because she'd always played a little softball on the side which is hilarious because she was so good at it. And she just changed her mind. And her parents were, it's your journey, sweetheart. However we can support you, we're going to support you. Because I don't know, a 10-year-old is not expected to think she's going to be Jenny Finch at 10 years old. Or it's just, it's too young. We put too much pressure on them, too young. I always recommend more than one sport. I always recommend playing in high school. Even if it's the most horrible high school ball you've ever played, play another position, be with your friends, play another sport because that's how they develop their social skills. But if they change their mind, they need to know mom and dad or whoever their parents are uh, or guardians or what have you. Um, you know, are going to love them no matter what. And I'm sure a lot of parents were like, oh, of course they, she knows I love her. Well, I don't know. You know, I don't know because here are my behaviors as a parent and here are my actions and the kid needs to know and she'll be at her best and it's okay if she plays in college and it's okay if she doesn't play in college because it it's supposed to be an add-on to your life, it's not supposed to be your life. It's supposed to be part of your life. So um, I would also say help each other, coach each other's kids. One year, if you, I know your organization is good like that, where you don't have a lot of parents necessarily coaching their kids. But if you find yourself, which is natural at the 14, 12, and 10 level, because your parents are your best people there, your volunteers there, but it's best then if they, if I coach yours and you coach mine so that the kid is clear about the relationships that, you know, um, that's that I always found that to be super helpful. Um, it can be the absolute most fun ever, um, getting to coach your kid until they're 15, 14, you, I don't have any problem with it. After that, you gotta let your kid go. It's a, it's a red flag to colleges if you're coaching your kid as the head coach. And then let's just say your kid plays shortstop or pitches. No one's going to believe it. Even if the kid really is that good, it lo you lose all your credibility. And, sh and she has to prove that she can play for someone else. So after 14s, it's best that they don't play for their 
head, the, if the head coach is their parent, it's best. Well, that's a good good recommendation. Um, so what do you think about our, um, I, you know, this can be brief, but what do you think about our hang tough doing the chalk talks like this? Uh, I, lo I love it. I mean, I think that anytime you can put verified important information in front of your families, it's a really added benefit to your club. In my opinion, when I'm choosing between clubs, um, and your club is doing a lot of recruit education is what I say, because the parents and the families need the correct information for them to make the best decision for their kid and their family. And when they don't have the right information, that's where the mistakes happen. You are doing your best as a club to get your families the best information that they have for them to make a super important decision. I think it's great. Okay. Um, I think anytime you have a speaker, the the listeners always have to, you know, make sure that it's relevant. Like my disclaimer is always, I've never coached high school. I mean, I can only speak to what I have experienced with helping high school, but I don't have those challenges, right? Um, I only coached in college and I only coached division one and I only coached, you know, mid American conference and up. Uh, so knowing how any speaker would have, you know, maybe a bias or something is always a good idea, but I think it's great. And you guys should know this too, that if you have a great player and you raise that great player in your club, in today's environment, chances are she's just going to get bought anyway. Some other club's going to come in and buy her family. And that's just the way it is right now. We have more we have more great softball players in Michigan not playing in Michigan now, only because they're being bought. Yep. It, it's unreal the money. They just come in and they say, you don't have to pay any of your expenses this summer. If your daughter plays for me, we're going to pay all our bills and we're going to fly you and your wife and your daughter to these tournaments. And um, so it can be very disheartening, but this is the thing I want you guys to remember and hang tough. The service you're providing, the opportunities you're providing, you're changing lives. You're impacting the community in an unbelievably valuable way. And whether you have a, Power five left-handed pitcher throwing at 68 ever come out of hang tough? I don't care because all these other kids and all these other families that are in your organization are having a great time. And the longer we can keep girls in sport, whatever that sport is, we know factually there are better outcomes. Doesn't matter. The longer she stays in, the better outcomes. And kids stay in when they have a good experience. And you guys are doing a great job. I The only recommendation I would have is spend every dollar you have on training your coaches. And, and I know you guys do a great job of getting your coaches to um, the clinics and, and, and connect with the schools you're close to. That yeah. is invaluable because that keeps you current. It keeps you up to date. And that keeps you disseminating the right information down to your families and your kids, because that's all they need. They just need good, solid information so they don't fall for, you know, nonsense. Um, manage expectations, right? Yep. Manage expectations. Um, yeah. So I agree, I agree with you 100% because it all trickles down back into the kids. So, yes. Anytime. Yes. Yes, and they're, these kids are our future. They're our future leaders. They're our future everything. And sport can teach and be a, an amazing gift. And I particularly am biased towards softball because there's so much failure involved in it that we build resilient humans in softball because they failed so much. And that's a good thing. 
I never want you to try to make anything easy or take any adversity away. The more failure, the better, because that's how you learn and you grow. So I don't want, I can't make the game easy. I can't make the coaching easy. I can make the kid harder. That's what happens over time is the kids that come out of this sport become super resilient because, I mean, just even the fact that they play outside versus inside, I think our kids are tougher. You know, yep. the basketball games always at the time it says it is, and there's never any weather. And, you know, where softball's like, you never know when you're going to play. You don't know what the conditions are going to be. You don't know how bad the umpires are going to be other than a level of bad. It's all good. Every bad call you get should be celebrated as an opportunity to just shake it off because you're not going to get all the calls in life. Things aren't going your way. So bring it, bring every bad call. Yeah, that was probably a ball, but who cares? I get three strikes. It's just the more adversity, the better. And that's how you build resilient, strong young women. Tough. Because they've been through it. And then when they go to college or they go to high school, they go to college or high school and then college, they get into life. When bad things happen and bad things will always happen, they'll be ready. That's what we want. We want them to be ready. We want them to be able to stand up for themselves and articulate, have conversations, speak truth to power. That's what you do. That's your gift. What you're doing is a gift to these kids, these families, and these in our community. And I mean that. That's great. Uh, oh, there's somebody in the chat. I'm waiting for somebody to like. <laughs> idiot. Yeah, I love your philosophy. <laughs> oh, it was it was just telling me how to manage the chat. Oh, yep. But yeah. listen, though, no, seriously, and when you follow up, and people have other questions, just I'll let them funnel them through you. I am happy to answer them. I have zero agenda. I'm out. I don't have to make <laughs> anybody happy. I'm yep. out. <laughs> Great. Um, yeah, it was one of the parents kind of chimed in and they said that they loved your philosophy. Oh, well. Yep. Yep. And it speaks true to, you know, people that have been doing it and things that, yes. you know, travel coaches like myself, we just... We listen to high school coaches and then we also listen to college coaches. And um, yep. I think some of the best people to for us to interact with are players because it's like, so what was your experience like, you know, like yeah. when you went to travel and when you played in college and having those people in the organization are just, you know, so valuable. Yeah. And my guess is none of them have come back and said, oh, yeah, it was a breeze. It was easy. No. <laughs> nope. None of nope. them said that, did they? Nope. It, it didn't matter what level they played. Even if it was junior college or NIA or division three or two, what nobody came back and said, Oh yeah, that was a breeze. That was easy. It's supposed to be hard. Yep. It's supposed to be hard, but you you're up for the challenge. They can do it. You can do it. And uh, the, the thing that makes me sad right now is the sheer volume of people getting out of coaching because they're just being run out by you know, we, we were just listening to the 1%. The one complainer is, you know, we're managing to the 1%. And it's just, it's running a lot of good people out of, out of coaching. Because, you know, at the end of the day, 90% is they're volunteers. You're not, yeah. getting, you're not getting rich doing this. I mean, now there's some club guys out West that are getting rich doing it. But <laughs> you're not getting rich doing it. I know that. No. <laughs> no, it's a uh, it's definitely a rewarding thing to be involved with um to see yes. you know start at something and see them excel and and then achieve you know what they've been working so hard for and yeah and then you uh, then they come back and 
you know, and they invite you to their college graduation or their wedding or their yeah. whatever. And, you know, you're, you're, you're really impacting people in, in a, in a, just a super, super important way. And it's a gift. You're, you're blessed to get to do it. And I know I certainly always felt that way. Well, we're right about that time, everyone. And okay. I know we, we have a smaller group on tonight, um, just with spring break and everything going on. Um, sure. Are there any any questions from the group? And I do have some canned questions if, if there are not. That's okay. People are wanting to get to happy hour quicker maybe. <laughs> They're on, so I see some beach scenes. I'm like, I'm a yeah. little jealous. I'd rather be down there with you guys. Yeah, yeah it's beautiful weather down here right now. It like was the, like 35 degrees here today. It was unreal. Yeah, there was 80 here. and. Sunny. Oh, yeah. yeah. There you go. <laughs> All right. Um, no, no problem. So I have a couple other questions for you. And I love okay. talking to you about this kind of stuff. Um, okay. So what do you think about the, you know, what do you think about the term culture? Like say, you know, every, every high school program, club program and college program, I've read books by like Urban Meyer and, you know, talking about, you know, what is culture and how do we establish a culture? And, you know, Deion Sanders is now, you know, doing it in Buffalo. And um, what do you think are the important aspects in order to develop a culture or what stands out to you to have it's, it's what you it's what you allow every day it's what you stand for every day if i went to your practice i would see your culture are we a culture of hustle and effort and enthusiasm or are we a culture of spoiled you know awful behavior, whatever. You can see it. You can feel it. And a healthy culture is one where everyone knows what the boundaries are, what the expectations are, what the standards are, when, where the line is. If your kid's know those things then you have probably a good healthy culture it's it's not something that um everybody has to be la la ha ha happy fun times right that's not culture that's the absence of standards or the absence of of expectations but if I ask the players, what's our culture? And they spit back four or five things that you stand for, then you're in good shape. They're in, you're in good shape. But they have to, kids have to know how we do things. This is how we warm up. This is how we play. This is how we uh, are a good teammate. This is what we allow from our parent behavior. This is how we travel. This is how we respect or not respect officials. This is how we respect or not respect our opponent, the game, yourself. Respect yourself. That's your culture. You know, for me, defining what does that mean? We, I insisted our kids gave great effort and played hard, right? I was at Michigan State, Blue Collar School, Tom Izzo, blah, blah, blah. What does that mean? Well, it means that somebody's shirt's got to get dirty on every pop-up. If everybody slides at every base. If, if we're going in bases standing up and the ball's there, that's not effort. Those are the, that's how you define it. Because kids don't know what you mean. The classic is, well, she has a bad attitude or she has a good attitude. What does that mean? Kids have no idea what that means. Here's what it means. When I talk, everybody's got eyes locked in. Look up, 
and look at me when, when I talk to you, how we greet and talk to each other, right? Um, being a good teammate, how you act when you don't play. That's, I don't know what you mean by attitude, but they certainly don't know what it means. So you have to define it. Define yeah. the behaviors that make up what you want. The kids don't know what that, I have a good or bad attitude. They don't know what that means. It doesn't mean that, you know, I brought cupcakes, so I have a good attitude. No. It means that when I took you out of the game and put Susie in, you went over in the corner, threw your glove, sat in the corner, and pouted for three innings. That's not being a good teammate. That's being a spoiled, rotten brat. This is what it looks like when I take you out of the game. Stand at the fence line. Openly cheer for your teammate. Be happy that she now has an opportunity to play. These are these are things. That's culture. That's what you're teaching. But you got to define it down to the behaviors because they don't know what we mean. Yeah, great answer. Lauren has a hand up. Yep. Mm -hmm. What do you like seeing from players in the dugout? I love enthusiasm, Lauren. I love happy enthusiasm into the game. I love players who know the count, how many outs, what the situation is. I love players who are just being a generally a good teammate. Somebody else is getting ready to go in and you're like, you can do this. Good dugout behavior is just being a good teammate, being ready to go in to do something for your team. You know, like if you're, if you typically go in as a pinch runner and it's a situation where you're usually going for a certain kid and that kid gets on base, you're there, you're ready. The helmet's on, the gloves are, your batting gloves are on. You're ready to go in the game. You're, you're in the game. You're not, you know, and you all know what it looks like when you have bad dugout behavior. Everybody knows what that looks like. So we, so to Lauren's point, we do have to articulate what our expectations are. Well, how do I want you to look and act when you strike out? How do I want you to look and act when you hit a home run? How, how, how do I, how do I want you to play in general? It has to be taught. Because they, you know, like innocently, she does might not know. Mm -hmm. No, no, that that seems to be uh, a reasonable expectation. You know, obviously to bring the players up in that, and that's something that we want to try to build too, from the ten U level all the way up. And so that's what the program, you know, what's the program known for, or what are right. people looking yep. at? Yes, yeah, and, and enthusiasm doesn't mean denigrating the opponent ever. I would never allow one of my players to ever have a negative cheer or chant or say a crossword about the other team ever. Even chants that seem innocent but aren't like ball five, ball six, ball seven, ball eight. You know, when the, the girl throws all the balls in a row, that's not, that's not cheering. We cheer for us. We don't cheer against anybody else. That's not good sportsmanship to want something bad to happen to our opponent. No, we want good things to happen for us. We cheer for us. I never, ever allowed any kind of bad behavior toward officials, toward opponents, toward opponents' coaches. No, that was disrespecting the game. And so our cheers had to be about us. You know, not against the other team. Yep. Are there any are there any other questions? Anybody else that wanna just just raise your hand and we can get to you guys uh, next. Um, the next question I had on here is, you know, just you know, what do you think about the the growth of softball in general? It just seems like it's been exploding over the last few years, I know there was some concern, um, you know, a lot of 
rec ball programs and so on when COVID hit, you know, what kind of impact it would have on uh, kids playing, you know, sports, but it really seems to have bounced back and seems stronger than ever. And we love watching college softball and um, obviously becoming one of the most popular sports in college. Um, what kind of things do you hear about, like at your level at Michigan State and about the game of softball in general? Yeah, I, I couldn't agree with you more on, on all those points. Um, at the Power 5 level, at my level right now, the the role that money is playing is changing things fast. I mean, you're allowed to just go out in the open market and buy players now in what they call the portal using money they call NIL. And it's changed the nature of relationships. And in my opinion, one of the main reasons why I got out is because I only ever got in because I believed in the role of athletics in an educational setting. I believe that we change lives through education, through the degree. And I'm all for softball and I'm all for winning every game anybody plays. But my focus was always on education. And to the extent that we're going to have a lot of kids go to school for five years and not have a degree, that that that's heartbreaking. Uh, more money, more exposure, uh, more opportunities. All that's true. At, we're, at, at our level, though, there's also a lot more problems because of that money. And and frankly, money makes people do crazy things. You know, there's way more cheating at our level now than there's ever been before. That's disappointing for me. Um, just that kind of stuff is hard. But 99.9% .9 of the people are never going to know that or see that. They're just going to see the growth of the game, the stadiums, the facilities, the great kids, the players. As long as we keep our eye on that ball, we, we, we stay away from any major scandals. Um, gambling is becoming a massive problem in collegiate sports. I just hope that it doesn't ever trickle down to the women or women's sports, but a lot of money involved now. And so it's no different than anything else in society. Sometimes money can, can ruin things too. So I like to just keep focusing on like what you're doing and, you know, and, and not on that other stuff, but uh, I agree with you. It's, it's exploding and it's, and we're not near our ceiling yet. Yeah. It's exciting. Yep. But like you said, it brings a lot it of is. challenges. Yep. So Olivia has a, yep. um, I wanted to thank you for coming on and talking to us tonight. Oh, you're sweet. Thank you for saying that. And I appreciate your effort because you made a choice to get better. And I hope it, it pays off for you because everybody makes a choice about what they do. And you had a lot of things to do tonight and you chose to do this. So good for you, babe. Thank you. And then I've got maybe just one more question for you here. Um, unless I see another hand pop up, but um, you know, that was, that was great talking about, um, you know, the growth of the game. And then I also had the transfer portal on here too, um, just because of, you know, it is, it's like just changing the landscape of how things are. Um, what would you say about, and this is something that, you know, it comes up frequently, um, but what do you consider leadership on a team? You know, you, you have players, and I think it's, it's one of those things that players are trying to find their way um, maybe their identity, and sometimes players think leadership is barking at your teammates and maybe not being positive. And, um, you know, and then, you know, leadership might mean something else to someone else. But, you know, I think us as coaches, we kind of have to need, we need to set the, the groundwork uh, for there to be a positive atmosphere um, and, and leadership to be done in a constructive way. And just wonder yeah, what you're 100%. Yeah, hundred percent. And I think that it, it where you're at, you literally also have to teach the ABCs of what does that look like? 
So instead of saying, Susie, don't strike out, you would be able to teach her to say, um, swing hard or, or replacing the negative with the positive, which is tell them what you want them to do. I like to think of leadership more in terms of influence, right? So on your team or on any of these teams, you have little mini influencers. You have people that are exhibiting the behaviors that you want to encourage and some kids who are exhibiting the behaviors you want to disincentivize. I want to spend most of my time on, on rewarding and incentivizing the behaviors you want to see. And then kids will intuitively notice that when I do these behaviors, I'm rewarded. And when I do these behaviors, I'm not rewarded. And they just need to know what those are. They just need to know what those are. And everybody has influence. So people will be like, well, I'm not a leader. Yes, you are. If anybody in the group is, is influencing something or somebody or someone, and the question becomes to the kids is, what influ What am I influencing and how am I influencing it? Am I a part of the solution or am I a part of the problem? I want more kids to be a part of the solution. You know, and yep. they'll learn how to show up in places as they mature. Some kids will never be vocal and still have tremendous leadership qualities through just their day-to-day -day behaviors. Other kids will be vocal and will be more of a distraction, thinking they're leading, but really just, they're just a distraction. They're just making noise. And to the extent that we need noise, okay, all right. You know, but at that, at the ages that you're coaching, um, teaching them the behaviors that you want to see, be on time, be enthusiastic, slide at every base, dive for every ball, be a good teammate, blah, 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 whatever they are. Yeah. And then you'll you'll be raising little mini leaders. But I had a conversation today with a college kid who's struggling and she's in so much pain. And this kid's a happy kid. She's a happy kid and she's struggling. She's not playing well. And, and she's just beating herself up over it. And, you know, I reminded her that there's a reason that when the airplane decompresses and the oxygen masks come down, that they say, remember, you always put the oxygen mask on yourself first. Because if you can't take care of yourself, you can't take care of anybody else. And so in your group, and even in this kid's age, she's trying to do so much for other people that she's gone to pieces. And I'm like, whoa, 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 wait a minute. The oxygen mask here first. And then other people will see you doing the things that you do to play well, and they'll emulate that. I'm, it's, I'm, I'm, I'm not talking about being selfish. I'm just talking about yep. before you're worrying about everybody else, I'm not a good leader, I'm not a good leader, I'm not a good leader. You got to you gotta come to that at your own pace and your own time. And, you know, don't forget, the leaders aren't leaders if nobody's following. So we need good followers, too. It's okay that everybody isn't the leader. We need good followers. We need the kid to be like, yeah, she's right. We need to cheer louder. Or, yeah, she's right. We could have dove for that ball, or we could have slid at that base. Or, mm -hmm. yeah, we got to, you know what, guys, we got to listen to coach more. Yeah. Being good a good teammate. follower is every bit as important as being a good leader if you're following the right people. 
Yeah. No, absolutely. Yeah. Well, this was this was great, Jackie. Okay. Uh, I've got so many topics I would love to talk to you about, but well, listen, I got all kinds of time now. So <laughs> Yep. Yeah, maybe we can get together for um yeah. dinner sometime with our families or something and just talk. Um be be yeah. fun. So Okay. I wish you guys the best and I really appreciate the opportunity. Yep. Yeah, and I, I appreciate you. your time. Thank you very much. And, no worries. Um, yep. Have a nice evening. <laughs> Thanks. Be safe. Thank you. Thanks. Make good choices. <laughs>